Yo, what's up? This is Jackson Cadbury, the Unqualified Engineer, back for the second episode. Today we're going to tackle a problem called Dinner Party. The idea here is that you're given a table, and that table will hold n people. And you need to figure out every possible seating of all of your friends at that table. For this episode, we're going to use Python, another wonderful scripting language. And in this case, it's actually a wonderful scripting language. So back to friends. You're super popular. You're perhaps the most popular person any of your friends know. What this means is you can easily fill any dinner table with any configuration of your friends that you choose. They will show up. Maybe you've got 500 friends, and the restaurant that you've got reservations to gives you a table for six. So the question you have to ask yourself is, what possible ways can you fit six of your friends at that table? Now intuitively, as a human being, you're going to choose your friends based on who you know, who knows each other. But what if you wanted to be more creative than that? What if you wanted to literally explore every possible configuration of your friends, every possible set of people that you could put at a table, irrespective of who hates who, who likes who, people from different backgrounds, people with different uh, native languages. You just want to see what every possible configuration looks like. An interesting aspect of this problem is that there's just a heck of a lot of ways to combine subsets of your friends. So for instance, if you had a table for three and you had five people to seat at it, it turns out there's 10 different ways to seat those people at the table. And for the math junkies out here, let's just walk through the logic of this. The fastest way to do the combination calculation, that is the number of combinations of a set choosing a specific number to form subsets, is represented by this equation. And you can see it works out that for five friends choosing three to seat at the table, you get 10 combinations. Now let's get to some code. For those of you who write code in Python a lot, this is really straightforward. You'll just be like, iter tools, combinations, blah. To you I say, no way Jose, that's cheating. We're going to do this with recursion. And I say this not because this is the only way to solve the problem, or the best way to solve the problem, the most terse way to solve the problem. It's none of those things. Using iter tools and the combinations function is a fantastic way to get this done in literally one line of code. But there's no challenge in that. And if you write that in a coding interview, you're going to get nowhere. That gives no signal to the interviewer. All that tells the interviewer is that you know what list comprehensions are, you know what the print function is, and you know basically how to use the iter tools library. No real signal in that. However, if you solve this problem in a recursive way, that gives tons of signal. Now let's talk about recursion. It always surprises me that so many people get so anxious about recursion. I think I used to be one of these people. And somewhere around interview 350 that I conducted, I had a candidate draw out a recursion table, just like this one. I gotta say, I was blown away. And we were solving a very similar problem, in fact. So what this recursion table lets you see is that for every stage of recursion, if you want to solve a problem like this, you basically have to recurse twice. You're going to take the current number and do something with it in the right branch or you're going to skip the current number, you're going to leave it out. And that's the left branch here. What this lets you do is slowly build up all of the possible combinations of the numbers. And where you end up, if you follow this recursive pattern all the way to the very end, is you end up with a thing called the power set, or the set of all possible subsets. In our case, though, we don't care about the power set. In fact, as soon as we get three numbers, real numbers in our set, we're done. We know that we are finished and we don't need to carry on any further. And what this means is that our function gets to pair off a heck of a lot of the recursion. This kind of function typically would be an two to the n complexity, and we can do a little bit better than that by not recursing in cases where we can clearly see that we don't need to. Now let's dive into our core algorithm here. What we said was we want to find all of the possible dinner parties. We've got a table size and we've got a set of friends, and we want to find every party that we could put together to fill that table. It's very often the case with recursive algorithms that the API you want to offer the world is different from the API the recursive function needs. For instance, we only want people who are calling this function to need to know about the friends and the table size we are going to handle the rest of the complexity behind the scenes. So we're going to put a facade function up first that says find dinner parties, take the right parameters that we need, and then internally we're going to have this function called combine friends that lets us do the dirty work that we need and not worry about whether or not it's a pretty API for the consumer. We're also going to store the return of that function in this variable groups so that we can presumably do something with it. Maybe we'll rank our friends or we'll decide who likes each other best and what the optimal dinner party is. Maybe that's a question for another video. For now, let's just print it. That's a pretty straightforward thing to do. Now let's implement the combinatorial recursive function here. I'm intentionally going to leave the arguments open-ended. Most people don't do this, and it leads to a lot of erasing. If you're in a coding interview, my advice to you would be to leave the argument lists open-ended. Just don't put that final parenthesis and colon, or parenthesis, 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 parenthetic, parenthesis, parenthesis, and curly brace. Just leave them off for now. You can come back to that later, and you won't have to do as much fixing your code. What we said with the chart was that we need to recurse in two directions. We know that already. So let's just jump right in and put that in. What we also said in that chart is that it maps whether or not to take or leave the current position. So I'm going to add a variable called position, and I'm going to start it off at zero by default. If you know much about Python, you will know that the default arguments are mutable arguments in Python. But in this case, we're just talking about integers. So I don't think we'll be mutating any integer values for the, the rest of the call stack. So what this means is that every call of the combined friends function 
has the opportunity to do something with its current position in the friends list, and then it's going to recurse with the next position in the friends list after it's done whatever it's going to do. This is the basic pattern of recursion that we know that we need here. And just like we said in the chart, we're going to recurse in two directions. In one direction, we're going to skip the current value. In another direction, we're going to include the current value. So if you assume we have a list one, two, three, four, we're going to recurse once, skipping one entirely, and we're going to recurse once, including one as the first number in our combination. To do that, we need something to store our intermediate set in. I'm just going to create a list called group, and I'm going to use that in both recursive functions. Now, I'm being kind of lazy here because I'm taking advantage of the fact that default arguments in Python are mutable and they're static across all calls. So what this means is that unless I'm making changes to the list, the, the group, unless I'm making changes to the group, I'm just going to keep passing it along. This should cut down on some of the memory overhead. It's a minor optimization, but it's the sort of thing that if you know how to leverage, you can actually win some strong points with your interviewer. For my algorithm, I really only need to make a new list whenever I'm going to add something to it. So I'm going to create another variable called new group, and I'm going to make a copy of the group list and do my manipulations with the copy which means in the right branch of this recursion, in the take side of the recursion, I'm always going to be passing on a brand new list. And in the left side, I'm going to be passing on binding to the same object as the previous function call. The last thing I have to do is append my current friend, my friend at the current position, into that new list, so that in the right branch of the recursion, the list grows by one. This is starting to look like a real function. This is starting to look like what we need. But there's an important thing that's missing here, which is any sort of termination case. Right now, the termination case is going to be whenever position is so high that it indexes out of bounds. So we need to put in place some sort of termination clause. And really, we have two termination clauses. One of them is when our current group is of the size of our table. As soon as we have, you know, let's say table size is four. As soon as we have four people in our group, we're done. We don't need to go any further. So right there, we can break. We also know there are going to be recursive cases here that don't actually result in groups large enough to fill the table. And in those cases, like once we get there, we just want to make sure we don't recurse any further. Now, I could have added some logic that would smartly terminate the recursion in cases where we definitely will never fill the table. We could do that factoring in the length of friends, the position, and the length of the current group. That would be a great optimization to do, but I literally ran out of whiteboard, and so we're skipping that for now. For the sake of brevity, I'm going to skip the careful walkthrough of the logic of the code confirming its correctness and jump straight to the complexity analysis, which is actually pretty interesting in this case. Just look at what we're doing here. We're basically doing all of the work to calculate the power set of the friends list and we're just omitting some results from that. Calculating the power set takes two to the n complexity. So in this case, if we were talking about calculating the power set of a list of five, that would be two to the five, so 32. In this case, we're actually clipping some out of that because we have this termination case of anytime the length of the group gets to three, we stop, which means we save some work. But if we were going to do that, if we, if we were being more naive about this, this would basically be two times two to the n because we do that additional recursive call in order to hit our finishing case where we append groups with the new group that we created. Now, like I said before, this is not the only way to solve this problem, nor is it the most efficient way to solve this problem. There are some really cool space for time trade-offs you can do here using bit masking and handing weights, or you can invoke the sieve of Eratosthenes if you want to go that hardcore. For a coding interview, I think this would be a perfectly acceptable solution to basically every interviewer I know. If you think you have a better way to solve this problem, comment below. And if you spot something that's wrong, please let me know. I am absolutely certain that there are errors in this code, and I would rather not endumin the rest of the world, so comment below and let me know what I've messed up. Also, if you have questions about this code, so far I'm finding there's actually a fantastic community of people who are interested in problems like this. So feel free to comment or ask questions about anything you want to know about this. If I don't answer you directly, I'm sure someone else who's watching this video will. Again, thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, and feel free to hit me up on Facebook or Twitter or so forth. I'm the unqualified engineer everywhere you can possibly look. Thanks for watching.